Welcome everybody. So we are here to hear more about um, theory versus reality part of OpenStack HA. We have um, Gurd Prishman, Shamail Tahir, Colin Nikolov, and Sri Ram Subramanian. Hey guys, why don't you go and introduce yourself? Actually, so we can just, we can just go in order, Gurd, so if you want to. Okay. Uh, my name is Gerd Prishman. I'm cloud architect with Deutsche Telekom since three years. And I led the development team that uh, set up and developed the first OpenStack production platform of Deutsche Telekom and put it into operations with the operation team. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Shamal Tahir. I'm with EMC. I work in the Office of CTO as a cloud architect. And based on how filled this room is and based on my shirt, we're clearly here to talk about the elephant in the room, which is high availability for OpenStack. Okay, my, uh, my name is uh, Callan uh, Nikolov. Uh, I'm a uh, cloud engineer at uh, PayPal, um, or eBay uh, together. Um, I've been um, in a kind of DevOps um, um, role in uh, most of the operations, and I've been involved in uh, uh, multiple um, uh, OpenStack deployments and upgrades. And uh, I am founder and cloud specialist at Cloud Dawn. I've been with the OpenStack community since Cactus Tableau days, and currently I'm helping the enterprise work group and also the high, high availability documentation. So um, we'll have a brief introduction to this lay of land here, right? Like what, what, what does this mean by HA? What, is the con what, what does HA mean in the context of OpenStack? And uh, what are the high level things? How do we get HA enabled, right? Like, yeah, we pushed a button yesterday that you can, nice. there's a pink button. If you click that on, then you, you, you'll have HA uh, all set. Of course, it's not. So um, the, the real meat is what the experience that from uh, DT and eBay. But to understand uh, a little bit more, right? So um, HA could mean multiple things, either, whether it's your API endpoints or your services or your applications running, right? And uh, br anything when you talk about HA, you're trying to avoid single point of failure. The point here is that, that there could be multiple SPU offs here. And uh, generic guidelines is you try to provide redundancy wherever it's possible. Uh, slap in a load balancer or, or try to have your cluster set up there, right? But these are all theoretical aspects. Um, the real difficulty is how do you get it done, what happens, and, and what happens when the, when, when the failure happens, how do you debug, or, or what are the challenges there? Um, as, as a high-level guidelines, right, when you're trying to provide, um, you, 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 you target multiple points, like whether you're trying to give, uh, take the services, are you trying to make them highly available, are you trying to uh, provide redundancy to the databases or your message queues. It's easier said than done. So I'm going to pass the mic to Gerd and then uh, let, them, <coughs> let them take over. Uh, we'll follow up with like, a call to actions later. Thank you, Jean. Sorry, by the way. Yeah, I was trying to say, why is it complex, right? At the outset, um, it looks very simple. It's all like uh, beautiful looking things and all, all simple things looking. But really, it is this. And then now you can understand, right? That you can identify multiple points of failures here, and, and then you can go attack each and everything separately. But the point here is that, that it is a very complex thing. But don't be scared. We have ways to, uh, we, we, people have done it. There have been use cases, successful use cases. Of course, there are challenges here. We are here to walk you over what is the reality part here, what you can expect when you take this journey, and finally, how we can help. Hope you can enjoy. So I will start with the, uh, uh, with the theoretical part about active-active uh, high availability with API service endpoints and database and networking as the, as the most important uh, parts. Um, thinking about high availability in OpenStack depends um, heavily on the technologies that you use in your platform. So for example, if you use different network virt virtualization technologies, then the HA concept might be looking completely different to another one. This is true for the storage backend or database systems as well. Um, the vendors, for example, or the distributions offer different technologies or combinations of technologies to achieve high availability or um, the availability of services. For example, combinations from Pacemaker, CoroSync, or HA Proxy plus Keep Alive, VRP, Galera, and stuff like this. Um, the following description that we present here um, from the theoretical part is derived from the OpenStack HA guide. So um, what's the target of active-active um, high availability? 
Um, in most cases, you just want to have more redundancy, more resiliency against single node failures, single service failures. So you try to have all the services HA, and that's not really true in, uh, in, in OpenStack, but it's possible for most of the services. So for example, for the stateless services, um, they could be load balanced, you could deploy multiple of these services, and you could use HA proxy plus keep alive um, to have an HA setup of this. Um, for the stateful services, um, like RabbitMQ or the database, there are individual technologies at hand that you could use. They are all different. You could load balance these systems as well. And then there are some services or agent where no HA feature is available. Let's come to the API endpoints. Um, you could deploy all the APIs on multiple nodes, for example, on an a multiple API nodes or controller nodes and then configure the load balancing via HA proxy and configure the resources in HA proxy. And then only the virtual IPs of this proxy will be used um, for the registration of the API endpoints uh, in, at the identity. Um, in all the configurations files, you will only use the virtual IPs. For the schedulers, they will be configured um, to use a clustered RabbitMQ um, broker or multiple nodes. For the databases, there is a well-known solution, MySQL or Mar MariaDB with Galera cluster with a write set library, uh, write set replication library extension. Um, this works for the active passive um, concept as well. Um, it's a deployment with multiple master nodes and um, you need at least three nodes to get a quorum because you need a majority of the nodes for a quorum. So if you only have two nodes, this is only 50% for a quorum if a node fails. So at least you need three nodes in case of a network partition, for example. You can read and write to any, any node, but this is optimistic concurrency. So if you write to two nodes at the same time, um, maybe one of these transactions will be deadlocked and the application has to handle this event. There are other databases available as well. So for example, Percona ExtraDB or Postgres with another replication technology would be usable as well. RabbitMQ, um, we would form um, a RabbitMQ broker consisting of uh, multiple nodes clustered and configure mirrored queues in this, um, in this RabbitMQ uh, cluster. This is done via policies and all the services use these um, RabbitMQ nodes. Networking is um, a very interesting part. Um, for HA, you could deploy multiple network nodes. The network nodes uh, at the end is represented by multiple agents running on this ne uh, network node. So for example, the Neutron VHCP agent, you could um, configure multiple agents. Then you have um, HA on these agents. Um, there is an, a configuration item to configure multiple agents per network. For the Neutron L3 agent who um, forwards the traffic um, from external networks and does the netting, for example, there are two options available. The first one is just a failover feature that you could use. The other one is to use VRRP, um, but then you would distribute the virtual routers um, on other nodes as well. And there are three agents where no um, high, availab high availability feature is available. Um, the Neutron Layer 2 agent, the Metadata agent, and the Load Balancer agent. Um, for this, you could use um, the Pacemaker or Chorusing solution, for example, that will um, uh, Shamil talk later in a few minutes about this. This is a deployment example, how it could look like. This is just one example. So as you can see, there are two controller nodes, and we put all the APIs on the controller nodes as well the rabbit in queue as well, and we have two load balancers to distribute the traffic and uh, realize the, uh, um, the high availability via um, Keep Alive with a virtual IP, and we have three database nodes. With this, I hand over to Shamayo. Right, thank, thank you, Gerd. There we go. All right, thank you, Gerd. Okay, so the way I'm going to approach the active passive session is actually um, based on how the OpenStack HA guide today reflects high availability configuration. 
And so this is a part of the theory, and we're kind of walking to the lessons learned of the current approach to the HA guide as well. But with that, uh, we're going to cover general HA guidelines based on the, on the guide itself, and then we'll cover the tools. So, you know, um, Gert mentioned Pacemaker, CoreSync. From an active-passive perspective, those are really the, the hallmarks of how you're doing HA. So I think it's better to talk about those tools and then apply them to which services uh, they're applied to within OpenStack. So in general, a lot of the requirements that Gert mentioned from, you know, the fact that, you know, components should leverage a virtual IP uh, still exist here as well. You should mul use multiple nodes, obviously. And at the same time, as I was mentioning just a second ago, a lot of the active-passive tooling is not OpenStack-specific. It's actually Linux-specific, more or less. So using standard, if you're a Linux admin or sysadmin, you've been using these tools probably for years. Um, you know, so Pacemaker, CoreSync, and DRBD for volume replication are probably the, uh, the known standards, if you will, in that world. So CoreSync and Pacemaker kind of go together. So quick brief on what CoreSync is. CoreSync is basically the messaging layer used by the cluster management system. So Pacemaker kind of uses it to maintain things like cluster membership and messaging for the cluster itself. Uh, CoreSync uses a redundant ring protocol. So you have two networks and you know, basically it'll use one or the other. And you can actually set it to active-active, so basically use both. Or you can set it to active-passive, basically when one, one ring fails, use the other ring. And then likewise, from a uh, deployment perspective, as you get ready to configure firewalls, if you have firewalls in your organization, as such as much larger, many large organizations do, um, from a port perspective, uh, you set the MCAS port, which is the receiving port, and then the send port is always that port number minus one as, as the, um, the send outgoing port. Pacemaker is what is actually your cluster resource manager. So cl Pacemaker is where you define your resources and, and what's the, the the resource that you're protecting, basically. So from this perspective, uh, Pacemaker has a few components as well. Uh, the main one is, of course, uh, you know, the cluster resource management daemon. But then the CIB, or the cluster information base, is kind of what represents the current state of the resources, as well as cluster configuration. That data that's in XML format is shared across all members of the cluster itself. And then once that data is available to the cluster, um, instructions to, you know, for, for uh, failover and state are sent to the policy engine uh, to the local resource management daemon. Um, and basically, that's where your local resources are managed. So LR, the local resource management daemon is actually outside the cluster, where the CRM is actually part of the clustered process itself. Likewise, if you run into a situation where you're in close to split brain or you have other scenarios that a node is misbehaving, uh, the stone int is basically the fencing mechanism that can basically power down a node. And you know, most of you are probably familiar with stone int, but if you're not, it basically stands for shoot the other node in the head <laughs> is, is what it comes from. So basically, that's its job is if something's misbehaving, just turn it off for now. Uh, and then likewise, everything that we're doing is defined as a resource agent, which are standard interfaces for what configurations and what options and how do I manage the state of a resource. So when we do things like Keystone API management through Pacemaker, et cetera, those are all defined as resources that we're managing. And the last but not least, especially for the database side, is DRBD which is distributed replicated block device. And basically what this does is it uses underlying block storage devices and creates a logical block device on top of them, i.e. You know, dev slash drbd number x. And basically the backing volumes are the ones that actually have the I.O. What happens is whenever a write I.O. occurs, it's sent simultaneously to a secondary node and then it's committed to the back end vo backing volumes of the drbd volume itself on the secondary node. When a read operation occurs, the read operation is serviced locally itself. And again, so when using this approach, you can anticipate a delay on write I.O. because effectively you have to wait for the other side to get the I.O. as well. Uh, whereas with reads, you're servicing locally and, and you're generally okay from a performance perspective. Now, having said that, how does this look together, right? So from an active-passive perspective in the database side, uh, what we have is we have MySQL processes and resources which are protected and managed by Pacemaker. And then we're using, the, we're using that MySQL resource or database backed by a DRBD or a replicated volume. And that replicated volume is what's making sure that you know, our, our data is available on the other end. And then likewise, CoreSync is keeping uh, health between them. And then, um, so this is how you know, the combination works to kind of protect the database in an active-passive manner. Um, Gert mentioned Galera, and I wanted to kind of just take this moment here that you know, in the HA guide, even though Galera, is, as we've seen and heard and we'll see again, is widely used from an HA perspective for databases. The way the HA guide is written today 
it hasn't been updated. So the HA guide says DRBD is the standard recommended approach, and Galera, while works, isn't really tested or recommended yet. So you know, we'll come back to how we're refreshing the HA guide. But these are some of the things that when you know, if you're new and you're using the HA guide to actually deploy and you know design your HA solution for OpenStack, some of the information in there needs needs refreshing. And I think this is where the reality part really comes into play. Of you know, if you follow that guide you'll probably get HA, but you might not get the ideal HA, and, and you might not really understand the implications of your design uh, by the guide the way it's designed today. Likewise, uh, for message queue services, the design is pretty much the same. They're relying on things like DRBD, et cetera, to, uh, back, you know, to provide the same services as the SQL database, so very similar uh, configuration manner. And likewise, from the actual guide itself, uh, the way the guide describes active-passive is, you know, you have uh, virtual IP interfaces leveraged by all services. In your configuration files, you use the virtual IP address. And then basically, you configure pacemaker resources, as we described earlier, for all of these different entities, effectively, uh, to, to do HA for your cloud. And as we'll see probably in the next section is, you know, in, in large-scale deployments and as we actually go into reality, some of these things will be different from how the guide describes them. And the last takeaway I, I, or lesson learned, I guess I want to say from the guide is, and the way we've even approached the session so far is we described active active, active passive, but the world doesn't work like that. It's not, you know, you're gonna do all active active or all act, active passive. Most clouds will actually be using some con components in active active, some in active passive. So the blending of the two is, is, is what the reality really is. So with that, Gert. So the the platform I'm talking about today is um, called the Business Marketplace of Deutsche Telekom. It's a software as a service offering to small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, and we are offering software there for, uh, from software partners like ISVs and from DT itself. Um, the platform is based on OpenStack and Ceph and is in production since uh, the quarter one, 2013. Um, currently, we are running a scale-out project. This is ongoing, um, so I have to admit that not all the stuff that I'm presenting here is currently running on this system in production. Some of the stuff is in testing. The other stuff is uh, running since two years on the system. The requirements um, or the target of this uh, project is to migrate the whole production from an old data center to a new one, to a high-tech data center. And the, one of the requirements is to scale out the capacity with respect to compute and storage and to eliminate as much as possible the single point of failures. Specifically, we are setting up this in two different fire protection areas in two physically separated data center rooms. In fact, this is a single region OpenStack instance running with highly available uh, services. All services will be distributed over the two data center rooms, and the compute capacity and the storage capacity will be distributed equally over both rooms. Um, all services, as far as possible, will have HA, and we will distribute all the operational support systems and services as well in both rooms. And we, in, um, we created a system to deploy the instances on this, um, on this platform with a system from, uh, of four availability zones, multiple host aggregates, and scheduler filters, so that when an instance will be started with a specific flavor, it will be placed in a specific security zone and specific availability and placement zone in one of the both rooms. This is necessary because we have a lot of pet applications running on the system, and they have to be distributed exactly evenly in both rooms. So what did we do? Um, we have load balancing with HA proxy and keep alive for MySQL for the services and RevitMQ and the APIs. Um, we are currently testing Nginx as well because we want to reduce the number or the, the amount of different software used in the platform. On other, on other levels, we are using Nginx uh, already, so we try to eliminate um, software for a specific uh, use case that we already run. Um, we are using Galera since yeah, two years now, and it's, it's running very good um, on three nodes in the data center, and RabbitMQ with clustered, uh, with a clus a clustered RabbitMQ with mirrored queues. 
Um, on Neutron, we have multiple DHCP agents started, and we use Pacemaker and CoroSync as well. On the API endpoints, we have load balancing with round robin distribution. And for the storage, we use um, Ceph clusters uh, for RBD, for the persistent volumes, and for the object storage S3. So what are the experiences so far? The load balancing in general works very well. Um, with a database, we have the issue that multi-node writes doesn't work very well. So one node is the master, and the other two nodes are backup uh, machines. Um, this diminishes the HA capabilities of Galera significantly. So if you lose this master node, you have to promote another, mode, uh, another node to, to a master and cover this problem. Um, that's uh, a problem with the OpenStack multi uh, capability to, uh, to um, achieve multi-write nodes, uh, multi-writes currently. Um, and then we have specific issues with this deployment in two different data center rooms. If you have two rooms and you have to deploy three different services uh, for, for Galera, for example, then you have an uneven distribution. And this is exactly for Galera a problem. If the wrong room with two nodes um, fails, because of a network partition, for example, or a human failure in the network configuration, um, then the third node will deactivate itself and then you don't have a database anymore. This is obviously a problem. Um, then we have a storage specific problem. Um, we configured our Ceph clusters with three replicas in the past. Um, but if you lose one of the rooms, then, then you will lose also a significantly amount of the replicas for, for a lot of data. And then you only have one replica left. So you have a lot of um, uh, traffic um, on the Ceph cluster to replicate all the data. And if you lose only one single disk during this re um, recovery time, then you will, will lose data. So we ch um, raised the replica level on the Ceph cluster to have four replicas, two in each room. Uh, we adapted the, the crush map to distribute the, um, the data evenly. And then this, is, this problem is mitigated. Um, in case of a network failure, for example, failure of a network node or a layer three um, um, agent, we need up to 15 minutes to recover from this, to spin up a new layer three node or move the, the, um, the, the router and to spin up possibly a new machine. Um, this takes up to 15 minutes currently. It's okay because this is not um, a public cloud. Um, this is a software as a service offering. So the operators are the only people working on the, on the API, for example. Um, with respect to the SLAs that we have, 15 minutes is the uppermost uh, limit. And then we have the problem that we run a lot of pet applications on this platform and they may suffer from a major um, disaster anyway. So um, these are not cloud native applications. We have for smaller deployments in, in one tenant, we have, for example, two web servers, load balancers in front, multiple database servers. If exactly 50% of this installation goes down, then some of the applications suffer from this failure anyway depends on the structure and the architecture of this application. And we saw DHCP agent failure sometimes. Our plans for the future, um, we would like to use um, distributed virtual router um, to make our network more resilient and um, make it more elastic. But this would require us to, to upgrade to a newer OpenStack version, for example, to Juno. And a third data center room would be desirable for us to distribute the Ceph replicas and, the, the, um, the, for example, the Galera nodes more evenly, one node in, in every room, for example. With this, I hand over to Colleen. Uh, hi again. Um, I'm going to cover quick, uh, quickly um, uh, the scope of uh, eBay, PayPal, uh, OpenStack uh, implementations that we have. Uh, I can see that we have uh, PayPal and web uh, and mid-tier is running 100% uh, and OpenStack. Um, uh, most of the dev uh, QA clouds that we have, uh, they're running OpenStack. Um, uh, the number of uh, hypervisors we have so far, it's um, 8,500, but this number is growing rapidly, so it's probably more than now. Uh, 
we have 70,000 uh, virtual machines, uh, all of them are KVMs. Um, uh, they're spread uh, in 10, uh, actually probably more than 10 right now, uh, availability zones. And we also have uh, several thousand users uh, in the DevQA self-service clouds. Um, the PayPal and eBay um, HA implementation, I have outlined um, several solutions that we uh, use. Um, but first of all, I want to mention that um, we're constantly evolving. We um, experiment with uh, one um, solution when if it doesn't work well, we try something else. Uh, usually in the last we try something, it works fine, but when we uh, got production, uh, large scale, thousands of hypervisors, we found, we f very often find problems and then uh, uh, try to mitigate these problems or try to switch to something more stable. Um, another thing that I want to mention for is that uh, um, we try to use VIPs, load balance VIPs uh, for every service uh, where possible. Um, so for, for, for database, um, we mostly use uh, MySQL multi-master replication. Uh, currently, we're trying to switch to Galera, and we already have switched to Galera and, uh, for some services. And the reason we are uh, kind of cautious with Galera is that uh, there's some issues with Galera. For example, uh, um, on tables without um, a primary key, uh, there's problem with the deletes. Um, we want to go to Galera, and we probably go to Galera, but more cautiously. Um, for RabbitMQ, we actually changed a couple of times uh, the solutions. Um, currently, we're using um, RabbitMQ, again, uh, it's behind VIP with a single node uh, persistence failover. Um, and we also have uh, implementations with uh, three nodes with mirrored queues. Uh, we are trying to move toward that direction, three nodes with mirrored queues, with uh, behind a VIP, with uh, list uh, connection. Uh, for uh, Neutron DHCP and for uh, LBAS, we use uh, Core Sync and Pacemaker. Um, however, we have some issues um, there, so I'll, I'll mention those issues uh, later on. Uh, for the endpoints, uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, uh, VIPs for every service um, with either a round robin or a list connection. We use three nodes, uh, three controllers for um, the OpenStack uh, uh, services. Uh, for storage, we use uh, just a shared storage with uh, either NFS and iSCSI. Nothing fancy there. Um, so here are the, um, the most successful implementations we have with uh, HA, um, as I mentioned, load balanced uh, HA using VIPs for every service. That's, that's proven to work very well. Um, we also use a single node failover persistence uh, profile for, uh, um, for example, MySQL VIPs and uh, RabbitMQ VIPs. Uh, that tends to be working very well, except in some cases, but I'll mention those. Um, also, we are switching to uh, Percona, Galera with Percona uh, for identity service. Um, that's for a global um, identity service. It uh, seems to be working very well so far. Um, and also, yeah, identity service is a global, uh, as a global load balancer. Um, where we have failures, um, one of the most annoying failures that we've been having is with uh, Corusync Pacemaker. And these are with, uh, basically for the uh, Neutron DHCP and LBAS agents. Um, one of the problems we have here is that um, uh, there's a lack of uh, advanced uh, health checks. For example, if uh, a service is uh, moved to another node, uh, basically uh, Pacemaker uh, knows about the service where it's up and down, but uh, it doesn't really uh, know whether that's the service really working. It needs more advanced, uh, like uh, ECV uh, uh, checks to basically verify that the service is really uh, working. 
Uh, and with Neutron DHCP, we have issues where uh, we have to do some manual cleanup, uh, on the, also on the namespaces. We have to uh, kill DHCP, uh, 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 sorry, DNS mask uh, um, processes. Uh, for RabbitMQ, we um, have uh, kind of mixed um, um, success with a single node follower persistence. Uh, in some cases, uh, that doesn't work well uh, and creates issues with RabbitMQ where we have to clean up uh, RabbitMQ. But uh, we are working on that, uh, basically moving toward uh, uh, three node uh, mirrored queue. For uh, MySQL replication, um, again, we are trying to use a single node persistent failover. Basically, we are talking to only one um, uh, master at a time. If, there's, if something happens to that master, it goes down. Um, the, the fellow persistence switching to the other node automatically and uh, someone is working on the, the other node to fix it. However, we, we have, um, uh, again, issues with uh, some cases with uh, uh, the fellow persistence. It turned out it's, uh, in some environments, it's working well, some doesn't. Um, for example, we found that um, in some uh, hardware I'll be load balancers we have issues, but it, most of the time it works with the software implementations. Uh, but again, we are trying to, um, and uh, the, the workaround that we have um, is that we have external monitoring and is disabling the, the failed member uh, externally. Um, but we are working on getting Galera implemented. Uh, for the VIPs, um, not all of the VIPs that we have currently are using ECV checks. Those are uh, enhanced con content verifications. Um, sometimes when we uh, have a VIP uh, and um, uh, we use only, uh, we just monitor the, the, the port using TCP and uh, that, doesn't, that doesn't always uh, tell that the service is uh, up and running. The service might be running, but uh, uh, it not, might not be talking to the database and there might be some other problems, so we need uh, this uh, ECB checks uh, to imp be implemented. Uh, the future direction that um, we have set uh, for um, uh, HA, uh, eBay and PayPal is that um, uh, we're trying to go HA on global or regional services. Um, for example, we have uh, one leg in each uh, availability zone. Um, we so far, we've been using that for uh, Keystone, Elbas, Swift, and it's, uh, it's working very well. Uh, we also, as I mentioned, we're trying to move uh, to three nodes, mirror queues with RabbitMQ. We have uh, already implemented that, and it's so far so good. Um, um, we are trying to get, we've been using the shared NFS for Glance. We are getting rid of uh, shared NFS. Uh, we've been using a uh, Swift cluster for that purpose. Um, so here's the, um, I just want to show the, the global service identity block diagram. Um, so we have um, uh, two global VIPs, one for Keystone, one for Galera VIPs, and uh, the global um, load balancer is basically stuck into three um, uh, AZ load balancers VIPs, one for uh, actually in each load balancer, there is a VIP for a Keystone and a VIP for a Galeria. And behind those load balancers, we have a, a cluster of uh, control nodes for Keystone and cluster of uh, nodes for uh, uh, Galeria. And um, what lessons we learned with um, this, this implement, uh, the HA implementations, we, this is just general ones that, um, um, Usually, we try to not to over uh, complicate uh, things. Usually, the simplest things work better than more complicated. Um, once again, try to simulate uh, failures uh, because of the lack of simulation failures. We have uh, these failures. Um, <coughs> if possible, place your um, services in different uh, availability zones or at least in different fold zones, different racks. Uh, different networks. Um, I will make backups um, in case of MySQL, for example. Um, I think that's probably the, yeah, that's the last slide.
can guys take over. I uh, hope you all uh, got a preview of what challenges that you face practically, right? Uh, also, one thing that um, we want to highlight, we talked a lot about the infrastructure, and then we were de dealing about how um, <clears throat> we have had success in isolating the failure, uh, uh, single point of failures across multiple either service endpoints or network or networking components, right? But HA could mean different for different people. And, and we haven't, we stayed away from your high availability of your applications till the onus is on, on, on the applications themselves. How can, how can they handle the failure? And also, you, you can understand why uh, HA as a feature is not a push button feature or, or as a, is built in by default, right? You have a lot of moving pieces, you have a lot of uh, dependent components, and then you have to deal them separately. Having said that, we, uh, as a part of the HA guide team, we are uh, refreshing our guidelines on how to have a successful implementation based on our experience, based on uh, the user cases, right? And um, also, uh, some of the distributions, uh, some of the commercial distributions, try to build that in, in uh, bake it in their in their offering, so that as a custom consumer, you you may probably have less work to do in terms of enabling HA. Uh, for more guidelines, you can always refer to the uh, um, HA guide. Uh, sorry, I didn't include a link here, but please feel free to talk to us. Uh, also, if you want to contribute, if you want to share your experience, if you have something to add. Uh, please join the enterprise work group. The link is provided here. Any any possible way that you want to share share your experience, that'll be great. Um, sorry, for more references, oh, you have the link here. So you can always uh, check these references out. And uh, as always, as a community, anything that you give back is, is going to be valuable. You can always, as the community, you can find anybody. Overall, the community is being very helpful. So uh, if you have any questions, please use one of the, uh, use the mic over there, or we can pass around the mic, and uh, the experts will be here to answer. You guys want to on stage, just in case they have questions. Um, one, a few questions for Gerd. Um, impact of uh, the, level th uh, the layer three agent failure, did you experience it or simulate it, uh, and what, because you spoke about it, and sort of what was the impact and the recovery? Um, we experienced it because we lost the node, for example, the complete node. We had to restart it, and um, then it took up to 15 minutes to recover all the networks and the virtual routers. And in the meantime, the VMs still spinning, but no access exactly. from the yes. outside, yes. basically. Um, okay. Um, the other question was... Um, Sorry. Um, how do you accommodate the pet applications in the cloud? <laughs> <laughs> um, we are running enterprise uh, applications on this platform. And as we started the platform two years ago, we had the impression, oh, we will onboard um, enterprise applications. We will have a lot of cattle applications. Unfortunately, that's not true. Um, nearly 100% of the enterprise applications are pet applications. So. Um, what we do is we offer consultancy to our ISVs, for example, or internal projects if they want to up, um, onboard um, an application on our platform. And um, we try to um, change partly the architecture or the application. For example, some of the applications write to the local file system. We try to convince the ISVs to use object storage, for example, mm -hmm. something like this. Um, we put load balancers in front of the services. We try to spin up more services. Um, on the other hand, unfortunately, we have to offer kind of legacy service. So for, for some of the applications, we offer in the tenants um, NFS, just to, to, have the, um, to be able to onboard these applications. And unfortunately, there are some applications on this platform that are only using one web server because the ISV is not willing to invest money to change his application. Um, but these applications might be uh, market leaders in their, in their section, in their branch, and then it's interesting to onboard them anyway. Um, the problem is that these applications were built 5, 10, 15 years ago, and there is no use case for them to just rewrite the application because it's hosted on a cloud platform. Um, so you have to find a way in the middle. And you have to change processes as well, installation, automatic installation, configuration management, all this stuff. Thank you. 
we can probably take one more question. We are running out of time. So, so uh, sorry. Um, a question on the peacemaker resource agents. Um, I found it quite outdated, um, and um, for the HA guide as well. Um, so, what's your experience with those resource agents? Do you have to extend them uh, for them to to be useful? Uh, give an example like the neutron error three agents. Uh, and do you need to update them, those resource agents, uh, for each um, OpenStack release? Thanks. We are using the, the default resource agents, yes. Yeah. So, so you, you don't have to update them for, for the releases? No, in the past, not. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank you.